All right, welcome. Today is Thursday, April 2nd, and uh, it is the day before our spring break starts because tomorrow is Cesar Chavez Day, and then we have our spring break. Um, we, we took a quiz yesterday, and uh, I'm just getting through the FRQ question right now. I've created more than half of the FRQs. Uh, so for those of you who have been graded, you'll 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 probably see like an updated score. So obviously, if you saw anything, it was without the FRQ part, uh, unless you saw it like five minutes ago. Mm, it is alphabetical order, and I am on M. So if your last name starts with M, I'm grading your stuff right now. <laughs> but uh, there are there. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of things, some, some tomfoolery, so, you know, and I guess some, some rushing at the end. A few of you just didn't have enough time. You're taking way too long on multiple choice. Now the good news is, I guess the AP test will not have multiple choice. So usually it's the multiple choice that uh, that students struggle with to finish on time in the AP test. It's a minute and 47 seconds per question. Uh, whereas in the FRQ, there's usually more time. But of course, based on how we have the quizzes or the tests on Canvas, it's locked, so you can't really skip around. Um, anyway, uh, we will move forward. Uh, we're kind of done with Unit 8. Uh, for for the time being, um, our focus will shift now to to start reviewing for everything else. Um, spring break or spring finals review time should be used to uh, do your two practice tests. So over break, over break, do the practice tests. You know, go to the AP1 review. We're, now that we're done with um, Unit 8, go to the AP1 review section. Okay. And then you'll see the two things for your spring break. And look under spring break. Spring break homework. If you remember, like the last actual day in school, I showed you where all that stuff is. You know, we're still following that trajectory. So now we're we're kind of done with unit eight, and, uh, and we'll move on to to doing the spring break homework. Right? Okay. Um, Now the spring break homework does have the multiple choice, but I think the multiple choice is good for at least concept review, right? It's still good practice. Uh, it still forces you to think uh, about those concepts. Um, and then we, we need to use all of that information to do these harder FRQ questions. Okay. Uh, there is a conference today for the college board at four o'clock and, uh, and we'll see what the president of the college board will say about the test. Uh, so I'll know more after today at least. Okay, so that's your homework for, for the break. Uh, let's, let's start by talking about, I guess, the FRQ question itself from yesterday. It's a two balloons question. This is something we already did in class. Just look at your notes. Uh, you've already done this. You actually physically did it in the balloon lab day or a balloon fun day, I should say, uh, where you have to get together with a different group. Is anyone here? Can you can you hear me? It seems awfully quiet. I hear crickets. Oh, there we go. We got someone. Uh, so we have balloons that repel. Okay. 
Um, for this question, it was very specific, and the College Board likes to do this too. Um, part A, you're supposed to do procedures. Okay, you've done so many labs and so many write-ups uh, where you know you're doing a step-by-step. -step. It's not different. I feel like you know as soon as as soon as the format has changed, instead of you know writing in a in a composition notebook, I give you a question uh, on on an internet web browser. All of a sudden, everything you've learned in class fell apart like a house of cards. Okay, everything is the same. It's your ability. It's all about your ability to apply what you've done, what you've learned, to these new scenarios, new formats, new situations. Right? When you're writing procedures, okay, just take a look at your lab book. I don't know. I guess I have them. Um, it's and you're probably not going to get them back unless you come back to me next year. Um, you number them, right? You number them, and it should follow a logical process in that you don't, uh, you know, you don't want to do the last thing first and the first thing last. Okay? It should be step by step. You're guiding someone through these steps so that they can uh, figure out what they need to, right? Uh, don't spoil House of Cards. I have been bringing it in my face. <laughs> uh, only watch up to like season four. After that, just stop watching. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't watch the rest of it. <laughs> just like you know, most shows, if they if they drag on too far, it just gets worse and worse. All right. Um. Let's see. So uh, make sure your procedures are logical. There's a step-by-step -step process to them. And most importantly, uh, even in your directions, it says, be sure to include what equipment you may need from a general physical laboratory for each step, meaning um, make sure you state what, your, what equipment you're going to use every time you say, make this measurement, make that measurement. Okay, don't just go say here, make, you know, measure the distance from here to here, but say more specifically, like use, you know, uh, I don't know what step it is, so I'll just, I'll just write it somewhere else. Uh, use a ruler or meter stick to measure L. And then uh, the length of the string. Okay, so be specific by incorporating the equipment itself into your procedure step. Okay, so I have a feeling that there's going to be some sort of lab question on your AP One test. It's just uh, it's a feeling. It's a very strong inclination. My spidey senses. So when if you do procedures, make sure you incorporate the type of equipment that you're going to use for each measurement. Now if you measure L, of course you have to divide that by 2 so that you can hold it by the midpoint. The other thing you could do instead of doing L, of course, you can do R, measure, you know, use a ruler to to measure R. And notice how by stating it this way, you're already uh, establishing your variables. Measure R, the distance between the two balloons. The, I should say, the center to center distance. Yeah, it's not just from the side, it's technically the center to center distance. between the two balloons I should say between between the two balloons okay and some of you used a protractor to measure the angle that's nice uh, but if you know the two sides if you know the side of the triangle and if you know the distance you can divide it by two to get a nice right triangle and you can use right triangle trigonometry to find this. If you found the entire angle, make sure you divide it by two uh, when you're using your trig function. Right? 
And from here, it's all about FBDs and sigma equations. Uh, if you do your FBD, you have tension, and uh, a lot of you got this part, so very good. Uh, F FT, MG, um, the force, the electric force pushes you away, etc. And there were also a few other uh, alternative approaches some people tried. It was pretty cool, uh, at least you thought about it. That part is pretty cool. And I'll talk about those alternative approaches or uh, uh, you know, uh, after this. But um, and, and a couple of you tried to tried to uh, tried to be clever, I suppose. Oops, uh, my thing crashed. Let's see. Uh, you know, uh, when you get a question like your math teachers, it will be like, oh yeah, yeah, find x, and then and then in your answer, you're like, oh yeah, right here, here it is, here it is. And some of you tried that approach. Um, oh, well, how many electrons? Well, of course, it's Q divided by the charge of one electron or whatever it is, the elementary charge, and must be Q over E. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so here's the difference, right? Uh, I know you're used to doing all of these hypothetical questions where you're given this, you're given that, and then you're just, you know, plugging and chugging and going about your way to solving for some unknown variable, right? But this is a lab design question. This is real life. And in real life, you're not given anything. You have to go out there, use your tools, use your equipment to make those measurements. Okay. So make the measurements yourself. Figure it out. You know, of course, you're not allowed to use Logger Pro here. I suppose you can, you know, technically Logger Pro, uh, Vernier cells, uh, uh, charge sensors and you can I forgot measurements were a thing <laughs> Mr. Z be spitting straight facts ah, thank you thank you um, so for lab design problems you know you have to make sure you understand that this problem is a real life problem something that you're actually doing by yourself in real life in a laboratory okay uh, you're not just gonna get like a little piece of paper that's gonna say, "Oh yeah, here's this balloon. It has Q, and it's no one knows what Q is." Um, you have to find it yourself based on what you can measure. All right. And so all the things that scientists, you know, eventually find out, all the stuff that you can't measure, they are derived based on the things that you can measure. All right. With that being said, let's go and move forward. So, uh, you know, step one in doing well in physics, draw your FBD. Now, you didn't actually have to draw the FBD. Uh, I think one person so far, I've gone through half of them. One person actually used arrows and tried to do an FBD. That was really cool. Good job. Wireless high five to whoever you are. I wish we had our wireless high five emoji. Um, Jacob, I know you're lurking. Uh, get that wireless high five emoji down. <laughs> um, uh, Jake, uh, Jacob from period three, not two. Uh, so, uh, and some of you just went straight to the sigma equation and that was great, so that's fine. Um, sigma Fy, sigma Fy, and the y-axis. Now based on what kind of angle you used, you might have slightly different, uh, slightly different ones. So let's say you measured uh, your whole angle and this was a theta theta over 2 or something. Okay. Theta over 2. So in the y-axis, if I break down my vector components, in the y-axis we have ft cosine theta over 2. Now minus mg is equal to 0. We are in static equilibrium so everything is nice and stable. All the forces are canceling each other out at this point. Uh, in the x-axis, ooh, I don't know. Let's use blue. Blue. Uh, in the x-axis, we have tension sine sine theta over 2 uh, minus the electric force is equal to 0. And from here is just substitution and then solving, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Uh, Ft is equal to mg 
Well, why this is okay? Mg over cosine theta over two. Now, of course, you're you're using theta over two as long as in part a you've already you know use a use a protractor or something or use trig. Uh, I don't know. As long as you stated that in part a in your procedures, use protractor to measure theta. Uh, oh, we have a follower. Yeah, very cool. Notice we we changed the animation for the follower. Ooh, check that out. No more zombies. Why is it theta over two? Because because uh, in the in the problem they said that the angle at the top of our isosceles triangle is theta. So we're gonna use half of it, which is theta over two. I mean, FT sine 90, oh yeah, yeah, that also works because uh, it is a right triangle and cosine of theta is the same as uh, sine of 90 minus theta. As long as, as long as you measured it and as long as you defined it in your procedures, you are A-OK. -okay. All right, um, and then plug and chug, so we get MG, over we're gonna substitute this thing into here so mg over cosine times sine and you get sine over cosine which is tangent is equal to the electric force blah 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 and from there on you can you can solve the rest of course make sure you define what r squared is r squared would be the center to center distance we did that here yay check okay uh, from here you can solve for Q Q is equal to the square root of mg tan theta over 2 times r squared over K okay and n is equal to all of this divided by e Woke up early today and turned on the stream before it started. Ooh. Can you write R in terms of L and theta? Uh, so if you didn't measure L, uh, sorry, if you didn't measure R in your procedures and you just measured L and then you stated that using a ruler, measure L divided by two, then yeah. Um, but you have to divide, you know, you have to state what L is. If L is the entire string and you're holding it by the midpoint, um, so here's our triangle. The hypotenuse is actually L over two. And so uh, if this is theta over two, then the distance, the distance, remember this is only half of it, we want the entire distance, would be two times hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. So R, the two's canceled, so R is essentially L sine theta over two. And it's two times because the balloon is over here and the other one's all the way over here. All right, TIL, did you, uh, did you get that? Okay, all right. So what do we learn? What we should learn is that when you write procedures, include the equipment in your step. Uh, but more importantly, make sure your steps are logical and they follow a process. It's one after the other, right? Ideally, you wanna measure the mass. We forgot the mass, of course, uh, since I have M in here. Uh, you can measure the mass. Measure the mass of one balloon using a scale measure the mass of a balloon using a scale right 
Okay. So lab design. Make sure you consider reality itself. You are doing it in your physics lab. Uh, you know, you have various equipment. And typically, here's the thing, even though I said no logger pro here, a college board will not say no logger pro. Uh, therefore, you are able to use your logger pro equipment as part of your procedures on the AP test. But make sure you don't just say use logger pro to do this. Make sure you are very specific in that you know you label what sensor you're using use a force sensor mounted on a car to measure the force during a collision or something like that so you want impact force well put the force sensor you know in front of the car or something and as it crashes into a wall you'll get a nice spike of f versus t and and over the course of you know the next couple of weeks before the AP test, we're just going to go over all of this stuff, every single activity lab, every single equipment we use, how to use it, what data it gives you, etc., so that you're ready to go in designing your own lab. Right, so that's the plan moving forward as we prepare for our final. Um, all right. Uh, the College Board should be giving us dates, I believe, uh, later today, and then we'll, we'll know a bit more at 4 p.m. Pacific. Okay. Um, all right. The other alternative methods some of you tried uh, was were interesting. Were interesting. Uh, some of you thought that the gravitational potential energy would essentially convert into electrical potential energy excuse me I'm getting I'm getting hiccups drink some water let me do a headstand hold my breath that should get rid of my hiccups is that what you guys do what do you guys do if you have hiccups uh, you can try to force the air out by trying to like squeeze it out apple cider vinegar yeah, we're gonna stay away from that one. A spoonful of peanut butter. Interesting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So the uh, alternative. Wait. So is n the number of excess electrons on the balloon that contribute to the balloon's charge? Yes. When you scare someone, their hiccups leave. That is also true, Ryan. Uh, uh, but I am not inclined to get scared anytime soon. I have to lock the door. <laughs> All right. All right, so the alternative methods, we're trying to see if peg mega equals PEE. -E. If peg mega equals P, then no bueno, the world will end. Uh, so let's say you had a dumbbell shape. So here are my two balloons, and you're holding it here at this point and they start to go downwards and accelerate. So, I, I, I mean, I, I see the thinking. I see what you're thinking, and that is cool. At least you're thinking. That's the most important part. And you can see how as they're getting closer and closer... <laughs> boo! What do you mean, boo? <laughs> it's good. You're thinking. Yay! As it's getting closer and closer, you get this repulsive force that push each other away. I should, I should draw the arrows the other way. Um, And, and so it slows down, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that was the idea. Um, now, does the string do work on the balloon? Well, technically, the string is always uh, 90 degrees to the displacement vector. Therefore, since work is a dot vector, f, f dot dx, uh, or fd cosine theta for, for everyone not in calculus, uh, you can see how, yeah, technically if you're if you're going in a circle then the string doesn't actually do work. Recall that in UCM when you have a ball on a string and this ball goes around in a circle, the string doesn't actually do any work. It does change the direction of the velocity vector, uh, but it doesn't actually do any work. Alright, but anyway, the string doesn't do work. So what happens? Well, uh, gravity is definitely accelerating it, so it, that's why it's going down in the first place. And it is true that the repulsive force is slowing it down, right? 
But that's not the only thing that is happening. Okay. Number one, the repulsive force, the electrostatic force, is a function of R. Okay. And so as you get closer, the force is even stronger and so on. So it's not like you can just apply the brakes. So it's not like uh, you can do like a... Uh, force equals ma and then the acceleration is based on how quickly it stops that's because the acceleration is non-constant right um, so the acceleration is not constant but that's not the only reason why this method does not work the main reason why it does not work is that the gravitational potential energy is not stored in the electric field it is not it does not become the electric potential energy okay if there was only, if it was a closed system, if there was only gravity and electric force, then, you know, as it's falling, right, it's supposed to be accelerating, it's supposed to turn into kinetic energy. If all of that kinetic energy turned into uh, the electric potential energy, okay, you can imagine it almost like a spring system. So imagine a ball, and then you have a spring, and then you have some other thing here, and this one's on the ground. So as this moves downwards, it's going to squish the spring in to a certain amount. Okay, This is beyond the equilibrium point because the momentum will carry you forward. Remember, we did this problem already. The momentum will carry you forward and go even further beyond. And so, um, so you'd have to somehow stop, stop the... Uh, stop the clock or stop the frame uh, as soon as you've squished it in at its maximum squishiness and it's and at that point whatever uh, electrical potential energy you have uh, I guess would turn into gravitational potential energy but that's not what is happening in our system right this would oscillate back and forth and shim so if you allow the balloons to go downwards and there was only electric force it would go downwards and then as uh, as you compress this imaginary electric field spring, this is the E spring, <laughs> uh, the hypothetical spring that you're squishing, okay, you would squish too far and then the spring would push back and then you would oscillate back and forth, almost like a Newton's cradle that never touches. A Newton's cradle that never makes contact. Right. Uh, and the reason why we come into equilibrium in the first place is because we lose some of our kinetic energy. These balloons are definitely going to experience drag force. The air is going to slow it down and that's why it doesn't oscillate back and forth forever. Uh, especially because the balloons are super light and their cross-sectional area is really huge. Okay, recall, you know, for... for force drag for no you know for slow moving uh, simple ball like objects we have some sort of some sort of constant times the velocity okay and of course you know for uh, for other objects that are moving you know faster than this you would have the the one half rho d a rho d a v squared or something like that, uh, where it's based on velocity squared. If you start going even faster and there's turbulent flow in the air and the air is chaotic, you can get a V cubed or a V to the fourth, etc. So light objects like the balloon with huge cross-sectional area A uh, definitely experience lots of drag force. So the drag force actually takes away some of the kinetic energy and instead of oscillating back and forth, the balloons come to equilibrium. But because the drag force did negative work on the system, some of that change in gravitational potential energy, when it was up here to now that it's down here, this change in height um, is going to be lost to the atmosphere. And therefore, uh, conservation of energy was not the way to solve for Hugh. All right. Uh, what do I want to do? <laughs> um, 
if you have if you have those resource books you should definitely use it to study uh, unfortunately the school did not buy resource books this year uh, I know right Vovat so today is review day number one so we'll start with kinematics kinematics we have set up Vovat Uh, write down your, your equations. What are your equations? Uh, D or displacement. D is displacement, by the way. Which is a vector. Um, all of these are vectors. Is time a vector? We never answered that question. We're not going to. <laughs> uh, it definitely does not point in space, so definitely cannot be a vector in the same sense. Or does it? I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's part of the fabric of space, right? Yeah, let's not get into uh, let's not get into a debate over time. It's gonna take too long. <laughs> um, these are all vectors now. <laughs> now. These two, VO and V, are technically uh, in your. Uh, oh, I, sh I should just write them down. So, initial. Initial velocity, final velocity. Another way of writing this, uh, it would be V as a function of time. So, V at time t is the final velocity unless it takes no time at all who uh, acceleration which is also another vector time uh, other things equations so displacement here's Raphael uh, Raphael is D is equal to V bar T and recall that V bar is the average average of two numbers man isn't it nice going back to kinematics days? Hmm. Uh, next up is Mikey, so V final. So let's write V final as V as a function of time is equal to V initial plus the acceleration times the time. Of course, these are all average acceleration equations. Uh, next up is Donatello. Displacement. Um, Displacement is x final minus x initial, or delta x, which is the same as saying x as a function of time, which is x final, using the same approach, minus the initial value, x naught. So x as a function of time minus the initial position, x naught. Back when we didn't know what an FPD was, yep. Those were the golden days. Um, and it's equal to V initial T plus one half AT squared. And the college board will allow you to move this over to the right side, and so they have X final is equal to X initial plus all of this stuff on the right side. So that's how they write Donatello. Leonardo was a v squared, so v, the final v, v as a function of time at the end, squared is equal to v initial squared plus 2a d, d being delta x. Okay, this stuff is all for constant acceleration. If your acceleration is changing, then you have to use calculus, right? But for us, what do we do? Okay, if my acceleration is changing, for AP1, if A is changing, use energy. Okay, so if you have a changing acceleration system, uh, make sure you use conservation of energy instead. So when is acceleration changing? So anytime you have uh, 
gravitational force that is not near the surface of the Earth. Okay, uh, so near the surface of the Earth, we say that g is constant, so the gravitational force is constant. Uh, therefore, we can use Vovat. But if you're outside of the Earth, remember we use F capital G, and F capital G is g m m over r squared. And since this is a function of r squared, then gravity, which is the acceleration, uh, is also a function of r squared. And it changes. The further away you are, the less acceleration you have, etc. On the AP exam, can we use the calculator's notation for scientific notation? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are graded by physics teachers and college professors, so they will definitely know the difference. You can use anything as long as it's right. Uh, let us see. So if you have a changing acceleration case, stick to energy. Otherwise, Vovat is good to go. Uh, recall that we can separate them into Voivayajit. So if you have if you have a cannonball problem a classic marble in a cup via cannonball oops my cup is too too close there we go uh, PTSD okay first of all break down your vectors into components if this is V this is V well, let's call it VO, the initial velocity. Okay, um, blue here is VOI, and VOI is VO sine theta, theta being over here. And uh, let's use green. Green is VO cosine theta. Right, so we've broken down into components. Of course, if you have a symmetric parabola, you can even use the range equation. Chat, what is the range equation? The range equation basically gives you how far down the field it goes, r. Uh, and it's equal to vo squared sine 2 theta over g, over gravity. But that's only for symmetric parabolas. So if, you're, if your starting height and your end height is the same, if your displacement in the y, if dy is 0, then, then you know, our, the range equation is good, to, uh, is good to use. But in this marble and a cup setup, where we're launching it at an angle, you can see how our parabola is not symmetric. So if you use the range equation, you can know how far you've gone in the horizontal, but you still have this extra bit. Now technically, you can say that it's a different problem with a, with a downward vector, and this downward vector would be symmetric to the original. So let me use orange to illustrate that it is the same, same vector, but going downwards now. Because whatever force was slowing us down is also speeding us up on the halfway after the halfway point. So this is the same magnitude of VO, but going downwards. And it's also the same angle. Oh, whoops. Uh, it is also the same angle here, theta. Right, so you can separate it into two parts and do that, or just do voy voyage it from, from straight. Let's say this is height h. Say that voy is vo sine theta. Vy, the final height, the final height, oh sorry, not, not the final height, the final velocity now the final velocity is actually down here when you're about to hit the ground okay and the final velocity is also at an angle downwards this way 
We don't know what the final angle is, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, it is definitely faster than VO. Can someone tell us why it's faster than VO? The magnitude is faster now. Chat, why is the magnitude faster for VY? You're accelerating further than you decelerated. Yes, you're accelerating further because you're falling H amount. So it must be faster now. Yeah, gravity accelerates it as you're going down this way. Uh, so VY is something that is unknown. Um, AY, of course, is acceleration. It's negative G. DY, how far I've fallen from the start to the end. You don't care about the actual arc or how high you went up. It's just from the start to the finish, so that's negative h. And time is time. Whatever the time is. Um, if you're given these things, then you can solve for the time. And the idea was that the time is the same whether you're in the y-axis or the x-axis. All right, so time is still time. Somehow it got bigger. <laughs> uh, we have, we only have, we only need three things: divot in the x-axis. And the reason being is that we are only accelerating in the y-axis and not in the x-axis. Oh no. Uh, a x is equal to zero. No drag. Right, and uh, dx is not r, it's actually the whole thing. And vx is actually the x, uh, v initial x, because there's no acceleration. And it's also equal to the average x, because if the final and the initial are the same, then the average is the same, which is equal to VO cosine theta. Man, my eraser does not work. That's unfortunate. There we go, VO cosine theta should be a subscript. Okay. All right, now uh, you might run into you know a quadratic formula to solve for time, so make sure you use the quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus four ac, all over two a. So you might have to use the quadratic formula to find time. Okay, sometimes you don't need the quadratic formula to solve for time in these two dimensional problems. Can someone tell us when you will not need the quadratic formula to solve for time? Can you say why it's the average? Yeah. Here you go. When you find the average of two numbers, you add them and divide it by two. So if you have, if you know that the final and initial are the same, and you add them and divide it by two, you're going to get the same number. When initial velocity is zero, yes, very good. When initial velocity is zero, when you can use Desmos now, <laughs> uh, when you use the solve feature in your calculator, uh, when the initial velocity is zero, that gets rid of one of the terms with t in your Donatello equation. And then, then they just actually can just solve for t. Uh, things to note. Well, how do I actually find this angle at the end? What is theta final? What is theta final? Ooh. What is theta final? This angle right here, when you're about to hit the ground. Theta final. Uh, 
All right, so what we need are actual components. Okay, if I, if I redraw this, uh, so imagine this vector being on the, at the origin, and it looks something like this, right? This vector is composed of its components, vy and vx. Vx is the same value, VO cosine theta. Yep, yep, yep. But Vy, how do I get Vy? Well, based on my Vovat, you'll have to use some sort of Leo or something. Or Mikey, after you solve for time, you can use Mikey. But uh, if I use Leo, Vy is equal to the square root of VO squared. Uh, which is VO sine of theta, VO squared, plus 2AD. 2 times the acceleration in the y-axis. The acceleration in the y-axis is negative G. Times D, the displacement in the y-axis is negative H. And then you can find theta final is equal to the arctangent of the y component over the x component. Now we're in quadrant four, so it's okay. You know, leave it alone. Excuse me. Remember, with your vectors, if you're in quadrant two or three, so if uh, if you're over here in the left side, if you're in quadrant two or three, add 180. Remember, arctan only works in quadrants one or four on the right side. Could you use energy to solve this problem too? No, remember, energy cannot give you vectors, so if you're looking for direction and stuff, no. However, energy can give you the magnitude at least. Uh, you can know what the final velocity is. That's about it, but you, won't, you will not know which way the final velocity vector is pointing. So if you're not concerned with direction, but you just want to know the impact speed or something like that, then yeah, energy is fine. So with energy, we have VO. And then down here, crash slide. So use the process. We should have saved this for the energy review, but I guess it's too late now. Uh, our starting point is this green point, our end point. Uh, let's say this is the orange point. What kind of energy do we have at the start? What kind of energy? Chat, what kind of energy do we have? What flavors? Okay. Well, how many, how many types of energy do we know so far? We know pegmaga. We know Ke, we know Pes. What else? What other energy flavors do you know? Mm, you should also know electrical potential energy now. Pe. Um, I also showed you Pec. Uh, Pec is something you'll use in the uh, AP Physics C test. Um, ah. Ke, you mean Ke rotational? K karat. Yeah, so we know rotational energy. The the C here is was the capacitor, um, but of course capacitors are not de are definitely not on the AP one test. They may be on the AP two test. So that one kid who's taking it, I forgot who it was. I think one person accidentally signed up for it. Uh, that one, oh, ion, ion, that one kid. <laughs> one half CV squared is the answer, where V is the v voltage. Uh, so for that one kid, it's one half CV squared. <laughs> of course, Ke rot is one half, we'll, we'll, we'll do this later when we talk about energy. But anyway, um, we have pegmega and Ke up here. What do we have down here relative to the green point? Relative to the green point, the starting point, we just have Ke final. And then you can set them equal to each other and solve for velocity. Mega plus one half m times VL squared is equal to one half m times V final squared. DMs cancel and blah, 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 blah. Um, kinematics questions, the only other types of things that I can think of would be uh, 
uh, car chase, police chase problems we've done, right? You have like a, uh, you have Shiraz riding his uh, Bugatti and it's going very quickly. But here on the corner, in the alleyway, there was a police car waiting for Shiraz to break the law, I suppose. Where is Shiraz? I don't see him today, so I'm going to pick on him. Here's our police car. It's waiting. Usually, to make it easier, the police car is like ready to go and takes zero time to get going. But anyway, uh, assuming Shiraz is just cruising along at some V of... Uh, how fast is a Bugatti? Well, let's say Bugatti is going at 254 miles per hour. Let me see breakfast. Uh, we're almost done. Let's finish up. Uh, what's 254 miles per hour in meters per second? 254. This is the Autobahn, so Shiraz is going as fast as possible. No. Actually, there's no cops in the Autobahn, so that's bad. <laughs> uh, 254 miles per hour. Well, uh, I need to convert it into meters. Uh, there's 1,600 meters in a mile. They're about 1,609. So one mile is equal to 1600 meters and there's a uh, 3600 seconds in an hour 3600 seconds etc but anyway you're going at some V uh, if the you know if the police car accelerates at a how long does it take how long does it take to catch up to Shiraz uh, in order to catch up okay you're gonna be you're both gonna travel some D amount of distance so the D for Shiraz is going to be his velocity times the T. And we know that the T's are also the same. Because uh, we assume that the police car starts at the same moment Shiraz passes the police. Uh, and the distance traveled by the police person would be initial velocity, assuming start, starting from rest, would be 1 half A times T squared. Right? So you can set them equal to each other. Shiraz's velocity times the time is equal to one half a t squared because they both travel the same distance in order to catch up to each other. And then you can solve for t. All right? Since t is a non-zero number, we can actually divide by t. Uh, so we get two times v bar, whatever Shiraz's v bar is, uh, divided by a is equal to t. Is that right? Probably. Alright, um, in kinematics, what kind of equipment, actually uh, we'll do the lab equipment some other time. We'll just, for a whole week, we'll just spend time doing lab equipments. Um, conceptually, this is enough. Okay, uh, now, no school tomorrow and no school next week, so no streams for the next whatever days. We'll start again April 13th when we come back to online school right now. It is, it is said that the infectious rate, infection rate, and all the uh, you know fatality rates all are going to spike over the next two weeks. So make sure you stay safe, uh, stay home, do physics because that'll save your life essentially. Uh, don't get into crowds or gatherings. Uh, if you have to go outside for emergencies, wear a mask or something covering. That's what the uh, LA, uh, the city of LA is saying right now. Make sure you use some sort of mask covering. Protect yourself for the next two weeks because it's going to get weird and rough. So stay safe. Uh, of course, you know, California is technically doing better in, in having, you know, cities and areas, even though we have high population. We're doing better than some states, at least, in following these mandates. Uh, other states like Louisiana and stuff are not doing so well because people are just don't care, I guess. Or Mardi Gras or whatever that happened. Um, so I will see you in about one week. Uh, do your do your review tests or the practice tests that are online on our website under the AP review section under spring break homework. 
uh, do test corrections on whatever you missed. All right, I guess that's it. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.